hello everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Alex Claire Young. I'm the co-chair of the trustees of the Open Table Network. Welcome to this Open Table Network conversation. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Rachel Mann. Rachel is a trans Anglican priest and author of Dazzling Darkness, Gender, Sexuality, Illness and God, and is one of the Open Table Network's new patrons. So, Rachel, you were one of the people who really helped me out as a young trans Christian um, quite a long time ago now. I think it was about 10 years ago. Um, so I was wondering what you would like to say to LGBTQIA plus young people now, today. Uh, it's a very good question, Alex. Um, I mean, in some ways, I hope that what I would say now is what I hope I said to you, which is, Please remember that you are absolutely beloved, a, 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 a beloved child of God as you are and who you are. And what I mean by that is as as the LGBTQIA person you are and that, uh, you know, I want I would want a young person to know now more than ever just how deeply beloved they are in their queer identity in their trans identity and their non-binary identity and that God celebrates and delights in that um I think I think what I would want to add which is probably reflects how the world has shifted not necessarily for the good although I think it's a temporary blip is Please do not listen to those vile, loathsome voices out there which are seeking to break and demean you and call you away from the person God is calling you to be. Um, I am shocked, as I suspect you are, Alex, by the shrillness and the violence that is found in so many voices. And... I want to say find that community of support, that 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 connective tissue that builds you up rather than drags you down. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there were some loud negative voices when I was first coming out, but it seems worse at the moment, doesn't it? It's a particular moment. Absolutely, and I think I think that it partly reflects, uh, whether <laughs> depending on your point of view, the maturity or the immaturity of, of and here's a phrase I only learnt recently, of the socials, as it were. Um, the sort of social media networks have found a certain kind of maturity, which is actually a deep immaturity, I think, where there's a, there's a sort of a, a bunkered violence um, and I certainly, I mean, I'm Twitter has been my main thing for the last 10 years. And when I first went on Twitter, I, I don't want to be uh, fantastical about it. They go, oh, it was so beautiful and simple and easy back then. But certain kinds of voices hadn't realized that they could e uh, exploit it to yeah. do harm. And now it's just used in such vile ways so often, although still so much beauty there. But you have to know uh, the mute button and the block button is a terrific thing. <laughs> Absolutely, definitely. Um, so I mentioned Dazzling Darkness a little while ago. Um, and I think actually possibly the first time that we met might have been at the release of the first version of Dazzling Darkness. And you just released a, a new version. Um, and it's such an important book. Apart from Twitter, what's changed since you wrote it? um well so much actually alex and you're one of those people who've i suppose educated me um i i thought i mean just a little vignette um when dazzling darkness came out i mean i knew i wasn't exactly in the first flush of youth but i thought you know i'm pretty hot and pretty cool on the old queer theology and and feminist theology and i had a lot to say as a trans christian person um but over the years i think i've had to discover an appropriate humility about how limited my perspective is i mean i think it's still the case and i i, I suspect this will resonate with you alex that 
people like me who belong to a probably an old binary understanding of trans identity are still often seen as the kind of normative oh you're the proper trans people and i realized i sort of carried those sort of internalized i think transphobic tropes in me and i've had to sort of debunk them and one of the things that's really true about the second edition of dazzling darkness is that i'm still telling an authentic story my story and i stand by it i've changed some of the language because it's out of date because the language changes so quickly but i also acknowledge in the set the introduction to the new version that non-binary people in particular have taught me so much about the riches of trans identity and that people like me the sort of old classic version of you know the the 1.0 <laughs> version of trans um for want of a better phrase um we're just part of a spectrum we're part of a story and that's always been the case mm. and and there's the riches of god are partly the riches of the, the broad spectrum of trans identity and that's hugely a big part of it as is um you know, there's a chapter about learning to be an out trans person in the church because now, you know, I can't hide. Um, and that's the thing with being trans. You can't win if you say I'm not going to be disclose who I am and have the, a certain kind of social privilege not to have to. Mm. That's costly. Because it deprives part of who you truly are in front of God and of others. But of course, being out means you've got a big target on your head as well. And it's a double bind being trans, but it's a beautiful bind as well. Definitely. Was that learning process tricky? Because some of these things are so internal, aren't they? And they're so wrapped up in how other people have treated us historically. Um, was it difficult to, to move away from, from the completely binary understanding? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm still traveling. And I, I think that's important to acknowledge that, that, I mean, I don't feel that, that uh, uh, in any way am I finished traveling on this journey of understanding. And I think it's the preparedness to travel that really matters. I think that's the whole thing about growing into the likeness of Christ as well, mm -hmm. is that it's an endless journey in this life. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, uh, you know, there are times when I check myself because I hear something new um, about the possibilities of human identity, not just trans identity, but human identity. And I, I, I find myself reacting out of an old version of me, a previous iteration of me, or I acknowledge that I have to acknowledge a certain kind of privilege that is also a deep damage. Uh, to give you an example, I'm probably, and I don't say this with any sense of pride, but just as a fact, I'm one of those people who, because I grew up in a world where I was surrounded by transphobic jokes, um, I, I, I learned to laugh along and I don't want to laugh along now. I really, and I also want to challenge them. But I also, there's a whole load of things that just almost sort of glance off me because I had to learn to be, oh, that's what they say about us. And and one of the things I'm learning is to say lots of things that are said about us just ain't okay. They're really not. I hope that makes sense. I hope that doesn't make me sound like an absolute, you know, horrible person. It's... No, that makes, it makes complete sense. I think a lot of us have been on that journey. I mean, I... I don't know how well you remember, but I used to have a very binary sense of myself. Um, and it took other people younger than me to, to help me to overcome that. So I, I completely get it. Um, one of the things I think Dazzling Darkness was important for is that it spoke really powerfully to the kind of intersections between trans identity and disability, which is something that I also feel really strongly about because I'm a trans autistic person. Um, so I was wondering if you think we pay enough attention to intersections in general? Absolutely not. Um, I, I think that um, 
much as uh, the word intersection has been uh, uh, inappropriately mocked as mm. a uh, a kind of loan word from academia it's like oh that's the sort of thing they use in the academy and that's not going to make any sense to any of us who are actually in the quote real world mm. now is the time i think now is the time particularly in the shadow of me too in the shadow of george floyd and black lives matter and very particularly in a time where it seems to me that disabled or differently able whatever the, the current appropriate best term is disabled lives are being denigrated and i think often treated as ever more marginalized because of covid mm. now is the time to embrace that word and i don't think even necessarily we need to use it what we need to recognize is the ways in which there are these these nodal points of power and privilege and there are points where i recognize that i have you know a, a huge white privilege which means that that black trans lives are erased um or and here's the thing uh, alex and I'm, I'm making myself very vulnerable here is there have been times when i have not been able to acknowledge my own disability um for fear that that will get me somehow marked down by the church for which i work or the society in which i li live and and yet if we cannot recognize the way in which our, we are we are bodies utterly caught up in this world in which there are points of privilege and points of exclusion and they are enmeshed and they are enmeshed with the lives of others then it's a recipe for abuse and re-abuse and for denigration and exclusion and stereotyping I mean, I, you know, far be it from me to, I mean, if I can ask Alex, I mean, just whether you could just speak into your, a little bit of your experiences as a trans autistic person and, and just how that's, mm. you know, how, what that means for you. I think, I mean, it's really interesting because understandings of transness and, and disability and in particular neurodiversity, um, which includes autism, our kind of academic understandings of that are growing and the idea that actually perhaps there is quite a big intersection there and quite a lot of trans people um, are autistic and to understand some of the gifts of that has been really important to me before I was diagnosed with autism and indeed before I realized I was trans I just thought there were things wrong with me um, whereas now I can see the positives and the negatives and I think that God is about kind of holding those together and it is that sort of um, the cracks or what let the light shine through that actually the vulnerability of our embodiment is part of the point and is why we have something to say. Um, I don't know if, if you relate to that. that I mean, for me, uh, the word which I overuse is is gifting and that it's 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 the gifts of the body it's the gifts of embodiment and i i guess with dazzling darkness and i and i i um i read it very much in your book uh, transgender christian human as well is is to say to be trans or to be disabled um to be trans and coded as other is not somehow a place of damage in and of itself it's not never a place which is somehow lesser in and of itself this is a place of great gift as well and resource and and therefore a site for joy um and and you know how often do we use the joy word you know i know it's being used enough i mean it's not being used enough in our christian discourses um but it's I, I I I would I just hope that those of us who are are queer can come to recognise the the joy in that, and it's not simply about God's delight, but it's just it's God's joy because God's 
in solidarity with this god god in christ knows limit and and in his her their particular wounds and scars offers a a, a, a wellspring of life for the world. Absolutely, and moving towards joy can be so empowering, can't it? I mean, one of my um, PhD interview uh, participants said that the Down transition wasn't about dysphoria, it was about euphoria, and it was about following the breadcrumbs of delight. Oh and I just thought it was so beautiful. Oh my goodness! I can't wait. I can't wait to 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 read that. Read more about that. Obviously, suitably anonymized and uh, appropriately presented. Yes. So completely different topic, um, although definitely related. Why does the Open Table Network matter to you? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, to pick up the thread, the thread, or mixing metaphors now, to pick up the crumbs, um, to th that that notion of 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 table and of bread broken and wine outpoured and it's so resonant of course but when it comes down to it um and i think that bishop paul bays uh, another of the, the patrons speaks so beautifully about this is recognizing that tables are places where we can gather but of course tables can be places of exclusion as well and at who's at the table and at the heart of open table um, is this sense that the table is Christ, Christ is the host, and also the feast. And that feast is offered without limit and for all. And you know, speaking as someone who for all my privilege and i have a lot uh, knows what it is to have been treated as lesser because of my queerness and effectively being disinvited from tables both tables for feasting and tables for discussion and conversation and tables of power when we speak of God's open table, we are offering a site of hope and a site of joy and a site of promise. Where the things which actually, you know, when we're entirely, when, when we go deep within ourselves as LGBTQIA people, we know that we have nothing to be ashamed of in regard of that identity. But it's always got to be relational. And when you have a community like Open Table saying, and look, God recognizes that and celebrates that, that just becomes a place where our hearts can soar. And and we we become the you know, the, the people of euphoria without ever losing sight of reality because that's the thing sorry I'm, I'm you're going to set me off now alex you, you I, i'm so terrible at doing this but it's that the you know the thing about god's table is that it is a cosmic reality of course it is for me i mean you know this is about the very structure of reality of god offering himself for us all as a feast but it's so practical and ordinary we all know what a table is and we all know what it is to be left out and we all know what it means to be invited in to sit there and gosh isn't it beautiful when we get to sit around the table together absolutely so going going deeper into that that cosmic table that eucharistic table or or holy communion is there a particular importance there for lgbtqia plus christians i mean you talked a bit about exclusion and invitation but but what does it mean to, to be at the table i think what it it, it means and I, I, I forgive me this is just a sort of very typical philosophical theologian in action here so forgive me friends who are <laughs> witnessing this um i think it's 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 about embodiment again i think it's about the body you know we talk about the body of christ that's one of the things we share at the table 
but it's also something of which we can be part. And when we share in that feast, what we are doing is we're sharing in each other. We're sharing in each other as well as in Christ, because we all, you know, we all bear the image of God. We're all called into the likeness of Christ. And there is this this sense of us being woven together in community. Um, that's why for me, you know, it's that one cup, one bread, one cup, um, because we are called to be one. And gosh, does that matter right now? Because as far as I can see, there's just a whole load of unhelpful rhetoric that's being sh said by many churches about unity is everything. You know, we we can't permit the full inclusion of LGBTQIA people in the life of the church because that would cause a fracture in the body. Well, actually, um, if we're not in, if we're not there, then frankly, the body is already fractured. Um, and I think it's sometimes only in the cracking open of the body as well um, that that we discover the fullness of the food. So I got an open table and you haven't been prepared for this question, so I'm sorry, but I am sure you will do it justice. An open table can have disagreement at it, right? You, you don't know who you're going to be sat next to. So what's it like being in that kind of interwovenness in the body with people who have differences of opinion and, and who might be, be the, the part of the conversation that is excluding us or wants us to be taken away from the table? I want to preface this by saying something which I, I always try try and say when I'm asked this kind of question, and it's this. If someone is outright abusing you, if someone is being utterly toxic towards you and utterly demeaning your identity, you do not you no one it needs to feel they have to sit there at that table you know, move down, move to a different place on the table, or you can walk away. And there are times when I think all of us need to maybe get, go outside and get some fresh air, metaphorically speaking. Um, I, I've sat in those situations on very many occasions and continue to do so. Um, what's really fascinating for me, Alex, is and give me some pushback on this or tell me if you think this this is skew with is that when we actually sit around Christ's table and it is Christ's table it's no one's table other than Christ's and there is disagreement and sometimes one sat with people who one knows in their heart of hearts would like to exclude us that proximity can at least in that moment change things a little it's so i mean to give you a very crude example it's so much easier to be vile to people through virtual means in my experience and to actually say it to someone face to face and if someone does say it to you face to face then they already know they shouldn't be doing it. They know they shouldn't be. And there is this, I think there is about a conversion that's possible through proximity, through the development of friendship, but it does require goodwill on all sides. Um, the other dimension to it is that because it's Christ's table, Christ is the host. I think Christ is calling us all to account and I say this with, you know, there have been times in my life and I will probably do it again and I'll probably do it five times a day as well, where I've said actually wicked and vile and unpleasant personal things against individuals that frankly I shouldn't. And, I, and, and it's a failure of Christ to me, but it might be entirely understandable because I'm angry in that moment. But the accountability comes from Christ who is challenging us all not to sit at the table for the sake of sitting at the table, but to sit at the table because that is where the word of life is and that is where the bread of life is and it is our only hope. So if we can stay sitting at the table, even if we have to move round a bit and find someone else slightly less toxic to sit to, is, is a powerful thing.
Absolutely. And I'm into that getting some fresh air first. Um, I, I can definitely resonate with that one. Um, so uh, on the other kind of flip side of that question, how can people be supportive allies to trans people if they want to help trans people to have a seat at the table? What are some, some steps people could take? So often this is, of course, you know, a contextual matter. Um, I think sometimes for those of us who get to sit at certain kinds of tables, tables of power and privilege, one of the kind of key audit things that I'm always trying to do in any meeting, any setting is who is missing, who is not here. Um, is, is everyone, um, you know, coded as male or female or how many people are non-binary, you know, how, is everyone white? Um, does everyone speak with the same middle class accent? And I think that's the sort of thing if someone is an ally and quite often I find that many of, of, of my friends who are allies uh, have got a fair amount of hard and soft power, a bit more than me sometimes. And they get to sit in those places and they should be doing that audit. We all should be doing that audit to say, you know, uh, to quote Hamilton, who's in the room where it happens? <laughs> um, um, I think sometimes, and this applies as much to me as a very, very privileged trans person, sh just blooming shut up, shut up. Uh, I need to learn to shut up more um, in certain settings. I mean, not necessarily when I'm sat in a um, I don't know, uh, a faith and order commission meeting, probably I need to speak up more. But there are certain settings where I I must not be seen as the representative trans voice, because I'm not. And it's I, I'm looking to see who else can can I encourage to step forward. But I think that for some allies, some cis allies, I think sometimes to turn down the volume on their own narrative and allow trans people to speak in a, hopefully a non-patronizing way really is significant um I, I, and listen seek out the story listen to people's stories and and check your privilege i, I completely agree with all of those and particularly amplifying trans voices i'm grateful to the cis allies who have helped to to get our voices out there but you know, we're here now and we want to be heard and kind of sometimes uh, letting us speak uh, sometimes would be wonderful. Um, so on that kind of topic of who's at the table, um, maybe a bit more of a silly question, but, but you might have a very good serious answer to it. Um, if you could choose to sit around the table with absolutely anyone, who would it be? Well, I, I have two two names uh the second one i might need to give just a warning that it is someone who is seen as transphobic um i don't know if i is that i mean tell me alex if i shouldn't go there at all but then no but the first one the first one is a biblical figure i would love to sit in a room with saint paul um partly because St. Paul has been so characterised as anti-LGBT, I mean, anti-women, anti-this. And I, I mean, I don't believe that. I mean, I, I think I th I've had the good fortune of being taught by some extraordinary Pauline scholars over the years who've helped me see some more nuances. I mean, I don't I'm not saying that Paul isn't problematic, but I think that that would be really, really interesting because I would want to press him, not least because he's been used and, and sometimes abused by some conservative scholars as a, you know, this tool of terror against LGBTQIA people. Just to say, Paul, when you said that, which has been interpreted as anti-gay, what's really going on? Because, you know, one of the words that he uses um, that's been coded as homosexual is is um known as a, as a hapax legomenal and that it's it's just used once and nobody knows what it means and i think he please paul help but i imagine that he would really not like me at all he'd think i'm sort of flimsy 
um, you know, a lazy thinker who's just a show off. Um, uh, but the second one, and I, I hope no one thinks that I'm being facetious here. This was something I raised actually in a, a seminar I gave uh, to, uh, and judge me for this if you like, to um, uh, Eton College. Uh, I was in to speak to uh, the, 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 the boys and masters of Eton College. And I said, they said, who would you like to speak to? Or, you know, if we could arrange it, uh, I don't think they can arrange it. And I said, I would actually quite like to have a quiet, low temperature conversation with JK Rowling. And there's a lot of, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I hope I don't need to go into the details why that could be problematic. And I, I'm not here to upset anyone or trigger anyone. But I, because of my background as someone who's read a lot of feminism from the 70s all the way through to the present, um, and frankly, in the 90s, uh, this might shock you, Alex, I, I was, I, at the time I was partnered with another woman and I was disinvited uh, from a, a, a women's group as a trans person. And, and I accepted it at the time. I probably wouldn't now. But I, um, I, I, I've lived with that version of, that second gen feminism for so long, I think I understand most of its moves. And I've also, you know, in my own PhD, I've used elements of that as well in very different ways, I think, to <laughs> uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists. And I just love to be able to say, really? Can we not find a way towards each other? Because I am horrified that certain kinds of feminisms are seen as opposed to trans people when we should be the closest of allies we really should but i it's never going to happen is it <laughs> it's never going to happen maybe not but i'd love to sit there with you i i thought it was so important to me actually as a young trans child we wanted to be harry um it's, yes yeah i agree absolutely um, so, from one book to another, I guess, uh, what barriers are there to the full participation of LGBTQIA plus people um, in the church today? There are practical barriers, of course. I mean, there are what we might say the presenting barriers, which, uh, you know, are often seen as the kind of shibboleths, uh, the testing points for orthodoxy for some people, you know, so it's to do with can um a, a, a same sex same sex couple marry one another in church uh in in the church of england for example you know that's seen as a barrier or why can't a civilly um married um uh, lgbt couple uh not receive a blessing in church you know those are kind of the, we see those as the kind of practical external barriers um to the full participation of LGBT plus people in the church today. And I do not want to you know, underestimate those. And I am grateful for the campaigners who are absolutely committed to certain kinds of shifts in our, the, the way we organize ourselves. But I think there are subtler barriers and here's the thing. I mean, it comes down to what we might broadly call a patriarchal slash het cis normative reading of a human being. That basically has at the top a white heterosexual male as the norm for a human being. And there's a sliding scale of norm. So then you've got a white female um heterosexual um person and you know and that the way in which they fully express their god-given reality is in marriage and marriage and that picture of of human anthropology it strikes me as just 
a distortion of reality and of God's gift in reality. A, as, as it is found in the facts of biology and of um, our lived reality, you know, as social cultural beings. But I also think it's, it's, it's a mis mistaken reading, uh, if understandable reading of the biblical texts. I mean, I think I suppose what I have to say, OK, I'll roll back a little bit on that to say I do understand why some people read the biblical text in a certain way. And I would want to say that there's a kind of consistency to it. I do understand it, but I'm not sure it's faithful to what's going on in the Hebrew or the Greek. And that to actually say that there's a one univocal way of reading the Bible is just so crude. It, it, it's all it's embarrassing and I think that that's the pressure point and if we can sort of work on that then the whole field opens up for God to greet us afresh as ourselves anew and delight in heterosexual people of course delight in heterosexual marriage but it's also to delight in the rest of us and see us as fully part of God's economy absolutely so I almost want to, to leave this question because I think you might have just answered it, but what one thing would you like other ministers to hear, be they priests or ministers of other denominations? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the cheesy thing to say <laughs> um, uh, is that God adores them. Um, and when I say that, I don't, I mean that in the cheesy sense. But I also mean it in a, I think, a profoundly theological sense that if God, as I believe, utterly cherishes each and every one of us in our God given uniqueness, then if we can fully embrace the and maybe we can't in this life, but if we can ever increasingly embrace that delight that God has in each and every one of us, then that is going to make available whole new ways of embracing those people who we've traditionally said, you're not acceptable, you're other. Um, you know, what does God, what, what's the, what are the command, you know, the two great commandments, what does Jesus say? Love God with your whole heart, body, mind and, uh, and spirit, etc. And the second is like, love your neighbor as yourself. And that sense of loving yourself, not in a sense of, oh, I'm so, I'm just so amazing. You know, it's, a, it's not a vain sense, but loving the absolute fibers of our particular being with all its awkwardness and, and fragilities and strangeness and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Goodness me, in the very least, that's going to open up a whole new field. And, and you know, if we've truly uh, uh, love God with our whole heart, mind, body and, and being, then, well, we say, well, who's God? And then we say, well, God is shown most definitively, certainly for me, in Jesus Christ. And how queer is Jesus Christ? But then we come to the very queerness at the heart of God's being, which, you know, I, I've spoken about on many occasions. The Trinitarian God is the queerest God we can imagine three yet one and i say that with no shame and i don't think anyone should be ashamed of saying that because this is the god who blasts open all of our reductionism all our desire to say there is only one way well this is the god that has community the dance the trinity but the oneness at his her their very heart just extraordinary absolutely Definitely. So um, thank you so much. We're, we're starting to get some questions in from, from the audience. Uh, the first question is from Claire. And Claire says, are there any resources that you can recommend that deal with the biblical or theological foundations of being trans and are affirming? I have to say that I found um, uh, Chris Dowd and Tina Beardsley's trans faith immensely enriching and very, very accessible. Um, because whilst it is a pastoral work in part, 
it has it deals so tenderly with the bible it takes the bible seriously in the way in which um you know so often uh progressive to, uh slash lgbt christians are saying oh you're not biblical well goodness me uh tina and chris they really wrestle with the text um and i i just think that that's a really really grand resource that is incredibly affirming about being trans uh but through a biblical lens as well as a pastoral one um so that's just off the top that's off the top of my head um how about you alex yeah no absolutely i agree um i think i'd probably add to that transforming by austin hart um austin is a, is a trans minister in the usa and he writes from his own perspective but also interviews other trans people and and quite widely kind of goes into biblical studies and dip, dips in and out of the bible but that's where the the quote god made the sea and the land but also the marshes comes from which i just think is beautiful you know god made night and day but also the sunset and that kind of poetic treatment i think of scripture is just so wonderful and affirming um, we've got a question from Chris, who asks, how can we support those who are most marginalised within the LGBTQIA plus community, for example, Black trans people? I mean, I think partly, uh, I mean, to reiterate a point, um, it's interrogating ourselves, if ourselves means that we are essentially a, you know, a a bunch of white people talking to each other and saying what's going on here what is this about i think it's partly about being good allies to those organizations which are foregrounding black voices or a uh, global majority uh, uh trans people um and putting our money where our mouth is as well. Um, I, you know, this is where I've got COVID. I call it COVID head. I just don't feel I have the recall I used to. Um, but I seem to, I have a recollection of being involved in, it was on, I think it was on Twitter last year and it was around this time. It was around Tidor and I, there was a whole bunch of uh, charities, particularly in the States working with, um, uh trans people of color and and just making sure that i was filtering some of my resources in their direction um that's the sort of thing that could be you know we can sort of trace back but um and the wonders of the internet of course mean that we can access that i mean i just i think those are a couple of things that sort of off the top of my head i don't know how about you alex no absolutely and i mean i think the thing we've kind of been talking about all evening is amplifying voices that are different from our own no matter who we are and I think that's something we can keep doing is see who's not at the table and and find them and amplify their voices because I wouldn't have started to speak out if you hadn't amplified my voice and so on. It, we can feed back the generosity that's been done to us, I think. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and it is that thing about, um, it sounds slightly pompous this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, about knowing when to speak and when when to shut up um it's very tempting for someone like me who has a very i have a very modest platform in the, the wider scale of things but i know i have a platform and i do have things come my way which say oh rachel will you do this we think you're great you know would you do this and actually having the good sense to be able to say now not not this time but let me direct you to this uh, th this person or d let me filter you through to Kieran at Open Table Network who will then cascade it out to a wider group of people and we will find someone, you know, and that's that. It's just it's just knowing when to shut up, which is actually a note to me more than you, Alex. <laughs> uh, all of us, I think. <laughs> Um, so Tina and Dave have asked, would you encourage LG LGBTQIA people and allies to engage with the Living in Love and Faith material? And if the answer is yes, what would you say to those who feel it's pointless to do so? Um, yes, um, thank you. Um, 
I, I, I think I need to acknowledge I have a certain amount of skin in the game here. Um, uh, partly because I'm a member of General Synod and therefore have had a certain amount of pri I had a certain amount of privilege access to the work streams as they were going on. But very particularly as a member of the Church of England's Faith and Order Co Commission, which is has a kind of supervisory role over um, theological work in the Church of England, I saw all sorts of early drafts of LLF and was invited to make a contribution to it. Um, my take is that I want to encourage everyone to engage with the resources, with this suite of resources, um, to do so with eyes wide open, uh, recognising that for many of us, we are probably at the very edge of what we can stand. This is, I think, probably the fourth or fifth thing that has come out in the Church of England in my time with the promise of something. And I am close to burnout in terms of thinking uh, I'm going to disengage. But the thing that keeps me in the room, and I recognise it will not keep everyone in the room, is the theological promise that I think is held within this process, with this suite of resources, if we can encourage people to participate. And, it's, and the theological promise is this, that at the heart of LLF, as I read it, both the book and um, these many of the background papers and also the uh, course, is a recognition for the first time in the Church of England that there are multiple legitimate and authentic ways of reading scripture. And that is, it may seem a modest thing to some of us, but that is a revolutionary moment in the life of the church. And I, as a theologian, I take that as a token of promise, which, which can lead with sufficient goodwill on as many sides as possible to actual practical change within the next three years. The note of caution is this. There will be, and we've I perhaps already witnessed, that there are some people whose sense of notion of participation in the process is simply to restate pre-existing, their pre-existing position, which is essentially a version of no, any movement from our position is a betrayal. We may have to acknowledge that for the Church of England to move, which it must, it simply, the centre cannot hold here. You know, we cannot hold to what we've had. In order for the Church of England to, to move, we will lose some people. And that might, it might surprise you, it saddens me that we will lose them. It really does sadden me. I think we are lesser without some of our evangelical um, uh, friends, in my case. So I, 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 I but it's going to be costly and recognise that it might not be your personal battle. We've all only got so much energy for this. But the truth is, if this doesn't work, then I, I don't know what we've got left except um, wreckage, really. And that might be necessary. Sometimes it's only out of the wreckage that something new emerges. Absolutely. So in a way from one big battle to another, this is a question that we got in by email earlier today. Um, there's a big conversation, as you know, going on about trans rights in the UK, in the government at the moment. And often that conversation has been framed as a debate um, between feminism and trans people, as you mentioned earlier. Is there a helpful way to, to respond to that? I'm not, I don't think it's a helpful way. I, I can't really see a terribly helpful way of responding on the socials, as it were. Um, that's probably why there's this instinct for me to want to be in in the room with certain people if i can have sufficient inner strength to 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 bear it um there is 
I think it, uh, I think it may have been Jesus who said the truth will set you free. Um, forgive me for making a feeble joke, but the, the truth does set us free. And I think it's really important for us as a community to keep speaking the truth, truth to power, truth to those who would diminish us. But I ask, and this is probably something to do with my squeamishness, perhaps it's to do with my privilege, but to find ways that go high rather than low. In other words, to find the ways which, which are about oxygen and amplification and about blessing. And what I mean by that is to say, I mean, I, I say this is something, I, you know, my life pretty much since I was in my... I don't know, late teens, um, uh, I've been pretty much saturated in feminisms of one variety or another uh, uh, and reading, you know, uh, reading feminist texts for 30 odd years. And one of the things we just need to keep saying is there are, is more than one kind of feminism and tell the truth of that and to not buy into the culture war analysis which actually in my view i think there's so much you know dodgy stuff going on where people are wearing the term feminism as a mask almost to just say horrible things and um, that's slightly paranoid but I, I sense that there are some people who are doing that so to maintain the plurality of feminisms but then this is a very personal thing this and I, I i at this point someone's going to say yeah but what about this what this person said i find it really really telling and I, and I remember saying this to a friend of mine who i think is instinctively a second gen fem feminist and has sometimes struggled with people like me and you alex um i remember saying to her um it's really telling for me that I've never been told that I'm not a woman by anyone other than a white middle class feminist. And I, I, I need to hedge that. Of course I do. But here's the thing. Um, there's a reason why womanist theology exists. There's a reason why uh, trans people of colour have started to think about how on earth they're included in the feminist story and it's because for a long time white middle class women often hetero women have been telling the rest of the world what it is to be a woman um and and i think it's really telling and it's about saying there are other stories this isn't just about trans people this is about intersections of of vulnerability absolutely Definitely. So you mentioned there wanting wanting to talk about blessing and we've got a question that, that kind of falls into that category. So I'm so pleased. This is a question from David who asks, what's the prophetic gifting of, of trans spirituality and mysticism today? So who are our modern um, Berdash or, or Two-Spirit people? I'm not sure I can answer that. I feel um oh oh dear i feel utterly exposed here in my inadequacy um help me alex i would suggest maybe all of the people who aren't to get heard because i suspect i mean tomb spirit and Burdash people that are very well heard in their own communities but not necessarily by others are they so uh... i i yes i guess so um i mean the very fact that i'm silenced is an indication of of the ab certainly the absence of their their voices and stories in my little world um which so is a terrific more... challenge actually that's a challenge to us isn't it we need more uh, trans prophets and if if there are any in the room please start speaking we want to hear you i mean i just to say i mean one of the things that that i i realized a number of years ago is that i'm not a prophet i'm really not a prophet i'm there's a reason that I wear a dog collar in the way that I do. And it's very much as a as a priest and as a pastor. And I, I don't think, you know, there's this huge, there's not necessarily a, a, a need to be binary about prophets over here and, and priests over here. But I feel um, I, 
I lose my confidence, I think, sometimes if I seek to speak out of a prophetic voice. Um, maybe I, I miss, maybe I do, I don't know, but I don't think I do often. Mm. Absolutely. It's, it's difficult, isn't it, to, to find the nuances in, in, in those, those different ways of using our voices. Um, so, yes, more prophets, please. Um, one last question, and, and it's one that, that I guess comes from a place of pain um, that I have also experienced, I suppose, as a URC minister, and this is from Dave, who asks, I'm wondering with the Church of England process around living in love and faith, whether other denominations can be helpful allies and concerns that our attempts at support might make things worse, as it seems we're not seen as valid Christians. That horrifies me that you'd not, uh, you'd have experienced not being valid Christians. I mean, I, I had the great good fortune of being formed for ministry at Queen's Foundation back in the days, uh, which is an ecumenical foundation, but back in the days when there were URC ministers, as well as Methodists and Anglicans. And I can't get my head around the thought that that some anyone would diminish you, Alex, or anyone else in that kind of way. Um, maybe it's a sign of naivety that that I would not be alert to that. It seems to me that all traditions and I, I would want to include absolutely uh, the very many Jewish traditions and Islamic traditions and indeed the traditions beyond the uh, Abrahamic faiths, which bring their own distinctive riches to unfold more of God's self and God's reality. Um, I am so conscious of how inward looking the Church of England can be. And I apologised uh, on behalf of my denomination if for anyone who's ever been diminished by us in our arrogance. Uh, let me just say this. I sense um, for good or ill uh, that the Church of England is being humbled very much so at the moment. And I hope that we discover in our humbling that we are not, we do not have a... a uh, anything but a paper privilege and that that it is in our receiving from those whom we've othered that we may yet become more of who we're called to be hmm. absolutely now i said that that was the last question um robert has given us a really short one so if you could answer it kind of quickly but it's a hopeful one so i want to ask it to take us from Christ the King into Advent, what gives you hope right now? What gives me hope right now? Right now, this gives me so much hope that we have gathered here from all over the place and we will not be silenced. We will not shut up, but most of all, we will carry on breaking bread and uh, receiving God into our lives and we have a gospel to proclaim and that gospel is one which celebrates each and every one of us absolutely so i think we've built up quite a to-do list there rachel we've got to get jk rowling for you um we've got to find some trans prophets sort of communism and um multi-faith uh, perspectives and celebrate the gospel which is completely keys. Thank you so much. It's been such a, a deep and wide and love-filled conversation. It, it's such a privilege and such an honour, Alex, to, to be in your company. Thank you. Bless you. Me too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So next, meet our patrons question and answer. If you've enjoyed this one, it will be on Thursday the 17th of December from 7 till 8 p.m. with the Reverend Dr. John Bradbury who is the General Secretary of the United Reformed Church, the co-editor of Thinking Again About Marriage, and the co-founder of Open Table Cambridge, 
and also my previous tutor, so I might be quaking in the corner. But no, seriously, John is lovely. So please do come along and John will be in conversation with the Open Table Network coordinator, Kieran Bohan, who is also lovely. So please do come along to that. But for now, thank you for joining us and thank you so much, Rachel. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. God bless. Thank you.